Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this installment of the Critically Black Dialogue series. Um, before we begin, I want to take a moment to lift up Malika Shabazz, daughter of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz, who recently uh, tragically passed away yesterday. I pray that the spirit of this conversation, one rooted in love and possibility, freedom, and the beauty and expanse of the African diaspora honors the life and legacy of Malika. May Malika's memory be a blessing and may she rest in eternal power. My name is Naja, and I'm the Director of Institutional Advancement at the Shabazz Center. I'm also a lifelong Central Harlem resident and I'm a student of the movement. I'm really excited to be building in partnership with the Caribbean Cultural Center and African Diaspora Institute. As Harlem-based organizations equally committed to building, organizing, and engaging in a praxis grounded in radical pan-Africanism, it only makes sense that we join forces through this critically Black uh, dialogue series, which examines what Black solidarity looks like today. Our panelists will take on an analytical retrospective approach to this conversation about past and present examples of pan-African solidarity that our community can continue to build on. I also believe that these sorts of conversations help to situate Malcolm X's global political vision within our current socio-political context, and it helps us make sense of white supremacy and its associated disasters. But more importantly, these conversations fortify the spirit and become roadmaps for how we move forward and build resilient and sustainable communities that reflect our visions for black sovereignty and freedom. Before I introduce our wonderful moderator, I would like to give a special thank you to Aliyah, Kat, Regina, and the whole team at CADI, um, as well as our panelists for making this evening possible. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in to us tonight. So our moderator for this evening is Lumumba Akinwole Bandeli, uh, who's a father, husband, longtime community organizer and educator from central Brooklyn. Lumumba is an organizer and coordinator with the Bring Sundiata Akoli Home Alliance. He is the former National Strategies and Partnerships Director at the Movement for Black Lives. From 1994 until 1998, Lumumba served as programming coordinator at the Franklin H. Williams Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute. During his tenure, he also co-founded Azabache, uh, an organizer's training conference and workshop series for young activists all the while as a Black Studies major um, at City College. He went on to receive his Master's in Human Service from Lincoln University in 1998. As a member and organizer with the Malcolm X grassroots movement, Lumumba helped to establish its campaign to counter police abuse and misconduct. He also founded the world-renowned Black August Hip Hop Project. Black August raises awareness and support for political prisoners in the United States. From 2002 until 2007, Lumumba served as a counselor and lecturer at Medgar Evers College. And in the fall of 2019, Lumumba taught an introduction to ethnic studies course at San Francisco State University. Lumumba continues to teach his community organizing class as an adjunct lecturer within the City University of New York. From 2011 to 2020, he served as the director of community organizing at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Lumumba currently sits on three boards, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Educational Center, and the Caribbean Cultural Center and African Diaspora Institute. Thank you, Lumumba, for guiding us through this conversation. And first, we're going to open up with a clip of Mal Malcolm X that will help frame this conversation. People, when we say Afro-American, uh, they think only of the Negroes in the United States. But they don't realize that two-thirds of Brazil uh, are, consist of people of African blood, which means they are also Afro-American because Brazil is in South America. And in all of these, uh, many of these countries in South America and Central America, and even in Canada, uh, they are heavily populated with people whose ancestors came from Africa. So when you total up the number of Afro-Americans, real Afro-Americans, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, there are perhaps 100 million. And if these people ever unite among themselves, not only is it necessary for the Afro-Americans in the United States to be organized, 
but, uh, but it's also necessary for the Afro-Americans in the Caribbean or the, the Afro-Cubans, uh, the Afro-Brazilians. It's, it's necessary for all of them to be organized. And then once they are organized in each place, we have to organize among ourselves so that the Afro-American in the United States will be uh, working uh, in conjunction in a coordinated program with those who are in Cuba and those in Brazil and those in Venezuela and those throughout the Caribbean and Haiti and in the West Indian Islands. And in this way, we actually get strength. And it's not an accident that there's no organization existing in the Western Hemisphere that's designed toward that end. It would be, the, one of the, it would be a direct threat to imperialism as it really exists and, and to colonialism as it exists in the West. And one of the things that's going to help to bring this about is, the, is uh, again, is the independence of Africa. And one of the only reasons in the, uh, that we in the West have never organized, we have hated our image and our African image. And because Africa has been in the hands of people who have created an image of Africa that's negative and hateful. And uh, it has been hateful to us. We haven't wanted to identify with it. But now that Africa is getting independent and in a position to create its own image and it's a positive image, uh, those of us in the West look at the African image and see how positive it is. We begin to identify with it. We become proud of, of Africa, and we, we become proud of our African blood, our African heritage. And this is what is beginning to make the Africans in the Western Hemisphere today ha develop more race pride. And as, as this race pride develops, then it has the tendency to make us want to unite together and work together. And your Western imperialists and colonialists uh, consider this to be a grave threat more threat than uh, communism or Marxism or socialism or anything else. The Africanism is what they consider to be the real threat. Peace, greetings, and good evening. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, in this very important um, dialogue series and in this very particular uh, conversation with this we're having this evening. Uh, thank you to uh, Nadja for the introduction, um, and I want to thank both the staff uh, at the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute and the Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Educational Center. My name is Lumumba Akinwole Bandele, and for the sake of this discussion, I'm functioning somewhat as a bridge. I sit on the board of both of those institutions, and um, it is important that I mention that to say that when we talk about Black solidarity in, very, in many of its practical states, you know, this particular dialogue series is something that we want to highlight as one of the ways that we uh, look at uh, models of institutional solidarity <clears throat> in collaboration. So thank both of the uh, organization staffs for pulling this together. Um, the clip that we just saw really quickly co comes courtesy of Malcolm's Disciples on YouTube, and we opened up with this clip to frame our discussion very intentionally in a Pan-African context of Black solidarity. So when we're talking about this, we're going to be rooting ourselves, our conversations in that. And so before we begin, I want to uh, take a minute to introduce our panelists for this evening. Um, this is always weird because we all know each other, and so we're in a formal space where we're going to read, read the bios, and we're going to do that for the sake of many of you who may not know who we all are, but we are friends and comrades. Um, and so it is really, really an honor to be in conversation um, with these two. And I'm going to start with an introduction of my friend of over 30 years, Rosa Alicia Clemente. Uh, Rosa is an award-winning organizer, speaker, political commentator, producer, independent journalist, scholar, activist, and former vice presidential candidate. A leading voice of her generation, the Bronx-born Black Puerto Rican is frequently sought out for her insight and commentary on Afro-Latinx identity, Black and Latinx liberation movements, police violence, colonialism in Puerto Rico, hip-hop feminism, um, third, third party politics, and more. In 2008, Rosa made her his, history, excuse me, made his, her story when she became the first Afro-Latina to run for vice president of the United States. Um, she did this alongside Cynthia McKinney uh, on the Green Party ticket. Um, since then, Clemente has continued to be a powerhouse. She is the creator of Know Thyself Productions, under which she has organized multiple national tours, um, PR on the map, an independent, uh, unapologetic Afro-Latinx-centered media collective founded in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria and the Black Diaspora Organizing Project, a recent um, 
a recently, she was, excuse me, also recently, she was a, associate producer on the two, 2021 Oscar winning biographical drama film, Judas and the Black Messiah. She's currently completing her PhD at the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Please join me in welcoming Rosa Clemente. Along with Rosa, we have our very good brother, Brother Bill Fletcher. Bill Fletcher is a writer, organizer, thought leader, and syndicated com col columnist, excuse me. He has been an activist since his teen years. And Rosa says that um, he's actually younger than me. Um, so you do the math. <laughs> Upon graduating from college, he went to work as a welder in a shipyard, thereby entering the labor movement. Over the years, he has been, in, been active in workplace and community struggles, as well as electoral campaigns. He has worked for several labor unions, in addition to serving as a senior staff person in the national AFL-CIO. Bill Fletcher is the former president of TransAfrica Forum, a senior scholar with the Institute for Policy Studies and in the leadership of several other projects. Bill Fletcher is the co-author, along with Peter Agard, of The Indispensable Ally, the Black Workers and Formation of the Congress of Industrial Organizations from 1934 to 1941. The co-author, along with Dr. Fernando Gaspin, of Solidarity Divided, the Crisis in Organized Labor and a new path towards social justice, and the author of They're Bankrupting Us a and 20 Other Myths About Unions. Bill Fletcher is a regular media commentator on television, radio, and the web. Thank you both for joining me. I am honored to be in conversation with you both, particularly um, as we dive into this, this conversation around um, black solidarity rooted in the context, within the context of um, Pan-Africanism. And so um, we started off this, this, this discussion with that very short clip of, of, of Baba Malcolm, who really instructs us um, not only around our global power and presence as a people of African identity, um, but also the responsibility we have to make sure that we are moving in a collective manner and making sure that we are attached to movements um, throughout the globe. So I wanted to just get some real quick feedback from you all from the lessons that we have learned in Pan-Africanism from um, Baba Malcolm and how that instructs what you are both doing today. And we can start off with you, Rosa. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me. And it, it is an honor to be on a panel with Bill Fletcher. He has informed so much of my work. And I think what's important is that we have had many a debate, <laughs> you know, and, and the one thing that that taught me was that we can debate ideas, but if we love our people, that doesn't mean we can't work together. So for me, it's all about relationship building. And I think that's what Malcolm represented. Malcolm also represented points of his life where he said, okay, I need to evolve from this, you know, or I need to see it from a different lens. But what it immediately takes me to and has been the center of my work is around identity as an Afro-Black um, Boricua and I think it's very critically important at this time that when we're talking about Pan-Africanism and we understand Garveyite and Marcus and Anna, his wife who wrote up everything and probably wrote all his speeches anyway, you know, and these women that were erased, that it's important to lift off Arturo Schomburg, right? And his seminal essay, very, a very short essay called The Negro Digs Up His Past. The American Negro must remake his past in order to make his future. Through it, it is orthodox to think of America as the one country where it is unnecessary to have a past. What is a luxury for the nation is a prime societal, uh, social necessity for the Negro. And that even connects me to today. I was watching Democracy Now! this morning and Hannah Nicole Jones was on. And I have followed her work, but this interview today that I watch, she encapsulated everything that is happening in this country 
right now and was able to connect all of it from the scholars to the streets to the suites and all of that kind of stuff. You know, she talked about we have to, you know, our children have been programmed, including white children, to uh, what this country is supposed to be about, that we're so afraid that we already know and history has taught us that we're already in a, fa a, a pre-fascist or neo-fascist state. And that unless we're able to do what Kwame Ture did, um, who was one of my mentors, uh, and connect Blackness as a global fight for freedom, then we get caught up in issues and particularly in asking white people to do the right thing as opposed to saying that we have the ability to organize. And that's what Malcolm did till the day he passed away. Indeed, thank you. Thank you. Um, Brother Bill. Brother Lumumba, thank you very much for having me on. And um, the, am I, uh, you're, okay. yeah, you loud and clear. Okay, you're good, good to go. And, um, and Rosa, thank you very much uh, for your, your very kind words. It's good to reconnect with you. Um, so I guess I would say that it's really important when we're talking about solidarity understand that there's a long history in Black America that Malcolm was a part of, but not the founder of, that goes back at least to the 19th century, maybe even the 18th century, of what came to be called Black internationalism. And Pan-Africanism is a, is a part of that, but it's not the totality of that. Mm. And and uh, let me, I just want to give an example, and uh, we could go into this later. One of the things that struck me is that in the 19th century, from the 1830s up until the Civil War, there were these things. It was the called the Negro Convention movement, and there were these annual uh, African American conventions held in the North, and um, different resolutions would be passed, and they would discuss where we're going, and. One of the things I stumbled across were resolutions in these conventions about freedom for Ireland. Now, the last time I checked, Ireland was not in Africa, nowhere near it, nowhere near the Caribbean. Uh, and, and yet there was this understanding of the Irish struggle for national liberation against Britain was something that we of African descent should be concerned with. And that was one of those aha moments. And it's one where you start to realize that there's been this current within Black America that has understood the importance of solidarity, not only within the African world, but in among the broader oppressed. Mm -hmm. Malcolm was one step in that long journey. And the remarks that you, that you played Really, they spoke to them very eloquently. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I do want to circle back to this idea of Black internationalism um, and hear more about it. But I actually want to have you both speak to um, what responsibilities do Africans in the United States right now um, have to exhibit principled solidarity with other Black nations or even communities globally? You talked about this particular experience. Uh, when was this, uh, what, what, what year was this, Brother Bill? It was in 1830s, 1840s. 18, yeah. Wow, wow. 1830s, 1840s, when people are talking about their relationship or their solidarity with the uh, anti-colonial struggles of, 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 of the folks in Ireland. Um, what does that speak to in terms of our responsibilities as African people in the United States? We sit and are situated in an empire right now, right? If not the strongest, most evil empire, um, what responsibilities does that seek say to us in terms of how we are situated, how and where we are situated in, in relationship also to our connections to folks throughout the diaspora, both people on the continent as well as those um, throughout the rest of the diaspora? Rose, I'm gonna let you go ahead first. Well. It, it's crazy because Bill bringing up <laughs> Ireland, right? Pedro Abisu Campos, who is the 
independista leader to this day <laughs> in, in Puerto Rico, when he went to Harvard to get his law degree is when he met up with fellow revolutionaries of the Irish Republican Army. And it was when he went back to Puerto Rico that there were, uh, I, the IRA sent the necessary arsenal for the Puerto Rican people to fight back. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're like, that's, and, but, but none of this again happens, you know, with, without relationships. So I think ultimately like our responsibility is we're born black into the world and we have to fight for black freedom. Um, I, I also think part of our responsibility in our specific generation, those of us born after 1969 and, and grew up in, in the Reagan era or as Bakari Kitawana would um, call us the hip hop generation, which I'm proud to be part of that uh, generation, that so much was kept from us. And unless you grew up in the movement, which to this day, most people still don't, it is a personal experience that can change your life, right? It, it, it's not going to be the theory, the methodology, the politics. It's going to be like what exactly happened to me when I saw Dr. Maita Moreno Vega speak. And I was like five people in a room that stood up and clapped and was like, how is everybody not giving this woman mm -hmm. that then would lead me to meet you Lamumba and so many other of my comrades. So I, I, I think part of our relationships right now should be, we've gone through this era of wokeness, cancel culture, all of this. And what we spent the last couple of years doing, I think at a, uh, not as an advocation of responsibility, but we've, we still keep asking the system to love us, to like us, to want us. So I think our responsibility is how do we create not only visions and institutions, but how do we create in our local community a, a society based on community mutual aid that is still connected throughout the world because we have access to technology that can connect us throughout the world to see what the world is doing and that everything we do here is not the most forward or progressive thing. So for me, it is about thinking now, what is my relationship to blackness, but what is my relationship to, to the younger generation and what is my mission? And I really don't have too much time left in this world in a big um, way. And I think, again, our generation has to come to a fact that we're about to turn 50. I was like, I don't understand how that's possible. And then I hear 30 years and I go, I don't get that. But then I see Bill and I see Martha and I see John Bracey and Bill Strickland, James Turner, Sonia Sanchez, who are like in the Pam Africa, who got more energy than anyone I've seen. But one thing that none of our elders have lost is about abdicating our responsibility to our blackness, but to our people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you mean. We, when you talk about our age and stuff, so I'm going to let you, I'm a, I'm, I'm gonna let you, I'm going to let you own that. <laughs> I exactly know everything. <laughs> Brother Bill, can you speak to this? You know, what I want to yeah. do, what I want to hear of, you know, mm -hmm. because we, 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 as I said, we're situated in a very particular reality, geopolitical reality with significant history and that speaks to a lot in terms of our relationships that Rosa's talking about, um, you know, internationally. What, what does that say and what, what responsibilities come out of that? Well, several, Lumumba. Uh, so one of the things that we have to be very real about is that we, we really are taught to hate our blackness and to hate Africa, actually to despise and to be ashamed of Africa and to be ashamed of African people. That's part of the upbringing that we have living in the United States and, and other places where white supremacy is dominant. I was at a, a meeting where someone was asking, how is it that Haitians can be treated the way they are, uh, Haitian immigrants, and, uh, and there's not more of an upsurge uh, by Afri US African Americans? And I said, well, it's pretty simple. We're taught to despise Haitians. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Uh, you know, in, instead of 
appreciating, and this is why history is so important, when you understand that Haiti is being, it is never being forgiven for having kicked Napoleon's ass, mm -hmm. right? When you understand that Haiti was blockaded by the U.S. and France, that Haiti was uh, forced to pay reparations from the 1820s to 1947 to France to compensate for the freeing of African slaves, then things start making more sense. When you understand the U.S. from 1862 on was intervening in Haitians, uh, Haiti's uh, internal affairs, it starts to make sense about the condition of Haitians. But when we're cut off from our history, we can often draw some really bizarre conclusions. Why is it that in 1994, we could celebrate the liberation of South Africa and in mm. 1994 be completely silent about the Rwanda genocide, right? So, so I think part of this, Lumumba, is we've got to appreciate the need to rethink Africa, rethink ourselves. And central to that is the issue of, of history. Uh, the second thing, and, and then uh, just briefly, is that uh, building it off of something that you were raising, Rosa, we've got to be undertaking the, the anti-racist struggle and understanding that the anti-racist struggle is central to the fight against right-wing authoritarianism. It's not just us struggling to make things better for ourselves. It's struggling to undermine the major threat that we're facing on a mm -hmm. planetary scale, which is mm -hmm. the spread of right-wing populism and other forms of right-wing authoritarianism. And that issues of racism, xenophobia, and sexism are central to the core of right-wing populism. So engaging in the anti-racist struggle is not just about improving our conditions, although that's critical, but it's really trying to hold back this monster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think part of what you know you both speak about is this this necessity to learn about the other realities of, of our folks across the waters and one of the ways that we know that needs to happen is folks need to leave this this the borders of this nation right rosa you were on this trip um that uh we coordinated to south africa in 2001. many people had not traveled you know outside of the country and so mm -hmm. that was a very informed uh informative trip for many people um but we know that when we go to some of these nations in solidarity uh, uh, de delegations, that oftentimes we have to recognize our own privilege. Mm -hmm. Not only recognize, but we have to be able to adjust and act accordingly when we are traveling in other spaces, because we oftentimes believe that we are coming with the histories that most of us just learned, right? We know that, you know, we, we've been fighting for our liberation since Africans hit these shores, but we know very little, if, not, if anything at all, of the struggles of African people in those places where we are going. And we tend to have a very US-centered sort of imperialist kind of uh, position around our struggle as being centered and primary over other folks. Mm -hmm. And we know that it is not until you actually engage other people that you realize, I need to shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. And and I need to recognize my responsibility as someone who is situated again here in the belly of the empire. Like I have some very specific things that I know I need to do if I'm really, really uh, uh, committed to deconstructing apartheid and I'm only miles away from Wall Street, that speaks volumes <laughs> about what my responsibility and role should be, right? So I, I did want to raise that. I think it's important when we recognize those those things that a key, key part of it also is our privilege, you know, and the duality of being African, but also having that blue passport, right? That means yeah. a whole lot, right? That's go, actually, go no, and I'm glad, I'm glad you said that because I, I was privileged. My mom my mom has been the type of person that has gone to national parks, been like, we're going to go here, we're going to go there. Today. So, like, I've traveled a lot. And going to South Africa was like a check on me, right? Because definitely the South African youth um, and the South African people were being kept out 
of the conference that was taking place at Durban, which was the United Nations World Conference around xenophobia and racism. And I'm in this hip hop space and I'm like, oh, I'm African and I got a tattoo. And they were like, <laughs> first of all, you're a white girl. I was like, no, no, I am not. I promise you I'm not. And second of all, you need to be quiet. And I remember that panel and the mm -hmm. what I remember all the artists and the one artist I'm always going to remember is Black Thought because Black Thought was like, yeah, everybody from the United States needs to be quiet now and we're staying here for hours. So all of that, it like traveling itself is a privilege, right? Like yes. I have cousins that at this time have never left their borough and probably won't ever leave it. Not because they don't have the opportunity sometimes, but because the, their whole world is the block, you know? So to me, that is a very important thing. Um, I think all of us should be able to get passports. I think we should travel and not be the quote unquote ugly American. And we have to know in the back of our heads, yeah, a, pa a United States passport might save you in a situation, but, um, it is important that we try, especially if we can send younger people abroad throughout the world, you know, to go out in that world and see um, outside of these, this, this part of land borders that aren't ours anyway, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there was a story uh, that I was told, it's a true story about an, uh, a U.S. African-American labor delegation who went to Brazil. And I was, uh, uh, I was told this by a Brazilian comrade who uh, was trying to be very diplomatic. And she said, so this U.S. African-American delegation showed up and was telling the um, Afro-Brazilians how to fight racism. And, and, uh, and people were very polite to the delegation but they ultimately said, uh, you know, we don't know why you're trying to do this um, and why you think your experience with white supremacy is identical to ours in Brazil. And this is the thing, you know, when you leave the United States as an African-American, you realize how American you are. And, and, and this is it's, it's very frightening. Um, and, and one of the things that, uh, you know, we could talk a lot about is the Latin American experience with race is very different than the North American experience. The existence of this in, uh, within Spanish speaking uh, Latin America of uh, what was called Las Castas that the Spanish established created a situation very different than we experienced in North America. And, and so this is why history becomes really important, because many U.S. African-Americans have no sense of this difference and can't figure out the Afro-Latinos. Uh, they, they just can't, they don't understand that experience and are frequently very arrogant towards uh, immigrants of African descent. And so uh, we need a lot of humility, but again, mm -hmm. we need to consult history. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, I'm going to remember that when we travel as African-Americans outside of the U.S., we be realize how American we are. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to and I'm going to quote you on that. All right. <laughs> so I want to I want to move the conversation on, because when we're talking about this idea of of solidarity and we've been talking about it within an institutional context. Right. And we know institutions reflect the political realities um, of our people. Uh, I wanted to ask you all, what individual practices do we need to integrate, individual practice do we need to integrate to lift up and normalize what Black solidarity actually looks like? You know, we can talk about how institutions need to move, how organizations need to move, but as individuals, there are many people who are viewing this who are not um, a part of any particular formation, but what are the mandates that we have um, as, as African people to begin to shift our framing on what solidarity looks like on a practical level? See, I, I think though the streets, like those are formations, you know, 
I think we 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 have a language. Many of us in, in movement organizing as activists, we have a specific language and and like words that we can bring up. We go into the streets and just, and I'm not saying just talk to people in the streets, but more like that grassroots intellectual knowledge that's in the streets. We're all essentially talking about the same thing. Like so, when young people are like, "Oh, the the police just pulled this over," right? Like. That experience is experience between anybody that, that is not white it, or whoever has been named the other. So I think we're moving into a space now that we have to see the community in the actual area that we live in, you know, as organizing spaces. And I say this as someone who has gone and, and covered and um, things that were happening. And I never wanted to, like, for me, Ferguson taught me a lot. Basically, Ferguson taught me, mm. like, mm. Um, you're stagnant in your politic. We don't want flyover activism. And once again, you can listen or leave. And that was a very humbling experience for me. And I thought I was always there just because all the people in my family, my own husband, so many of us that we know have suffered through incarceration and, and dealing with the state and government, police, terror, police, violence, and all of that. You know, I was like, oh, I'm good. Like, I should be here. And they were like, it's not that you should not be here. It's just that, like, you're going to leave in three days and go back to your privileged environment. And I had to um, reconcile that within myself and not feel guilty about it and then be committed now to, to making sure I continue to listen. And the way I can do that most effectively in my household is listening to my 16 year old daughter who every day has to leave high school with horses and police ready to pepper spray kids because there's not enough buses to take them after school and there's no community centers in Albany, New York, you know, and all the politics that I can talk, it, you know, it wasn't solving and it hasn't solved the condition in Albany, but what it has done for me is allow me to also be like, yo, you need to uplift younger people now, just how you were uplifted. You need to do the same right now or you will get stagnant and you will get myopic and you will get pessimistic and we cannot afford those things in, in, in where we're at now, at, at the onslaught of white terror against black and brown people, especially here in this country. Mm -hmm. you. you know, I, I think that um, it was interesting. I was, I was thinking over your question, Lumumba, um, People that are not in organizations should join organizations. I mean, that's the first issue about solidarity, uh, that it's not mainly about personal expressions of moralism. It's getting involved with other people and engaging in collective struggle. So the first act of solidarity is with your colleagues, your comrades, your friends, working together on something. The second thing is uh, moving an internal... Um, an educational process to understand more about the world. You know, I, I remember uh, when I was running Trans Africa Forum in the early 2000s, um, my daughter, who was in high school at the time, uh, had a friend over at the house. And I had been on radio or something talking about the Sudan. And and she heard me, my, my, my daughter's friend. And she said, Mr. Fletcher, I heard you speaking about the Sudan. And I was elated and I said, great. Uh, do you know where that is? And she said, uh, yeah, it's near California, isn't it? And, and so one of the problems is that we not only like historical information, but geographical, which most people around the world can't afford. They can't afford that level of ignorance. They can't afford to not know where the United States is, for example. So, um, so a second thing is education, educating people. Third thing is, is, um, the broad idea of a, of a culture of solidarity. And, and I mean that in a lot of different ways. I mean, attention to music, um, murals. I think about the murals in Belfast when I was there in 88 that were very internationalist, um, that, that really try to show people 
the connections between different struggles. It's building that kind of culture of solidarity. All of that becomes important. And these are things that individuals can do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do I want appreciate. to say, you know, Go ahead. right now, um, anyone under 35, but particularly, I would say, 12 to 25-year-olds are completely we weary and will not join organizations. All they know now is the negative connotations of an organization, i.e. an institution, right? And that's a mistake. I don't, I think that's a mistake that's happening. But again, seeing it through my daughter's eyes, she's like, mommy, none of us trust any groups. You know, we go into meetings and there's still patriarchy and heteronormative, and we're just not going to handle that anymore. We're going to walk away from it. You know, and I was like, well, don't you want to get in the trenches and fight this? She's like, absolutely not, because you have destroyed the world. <laughs> she was like, climate catastrophe. And then that we're I, now all of our conversation has to have the intersection of COVID, right? Because one day our young kids were in an in institution, organization, environment that was like, rudimentary and knew everything. And one day they were out of that. And the levels of depression, I just got an email today from the superintendent. She's incredible. We were so lucky to have her in Albany, a, a sister. That the suicide ideation in the high school that my daughter's in has gone up almost 47% but that they consistently have to go to virtual learning because they lost so many staff members, right? And Albany is, to me, is always a microcosm because it's, a, it's less than a community of 100,000. All that is that I don't actually know the, the, the answer anymore to what we should be doing and what the movement looks like and what it means to have privilege and so many still have inequity. Um, and, and lastly, this climate catastrophe that we're in. So I'm not disagreeing with Bill in, in any way in saying we don't need organization. Mm -hmm. I think we have to find a different way of what organization movement looks like. Right. Well, you know, I think part of what and you and I were there, um, I think on more than one occasion in Ferguson, that I learned is organization can take different forms. Leadership can and will take different forms. Many people who also came down to Ferguson were looking for the traditional black male preacher, straight, hetero uh, leader, right? And they were looking for that and never, never found it and actually walked away saying that this particular movement was leaderless, was disorganized was without any kind of uh, specific uh, objective or agenda, when in actuality, it was the opposite. It was leaderful. Um, and what we saw as leaders were um, trans people, were homeless people, disabled folks, and many of them organized in many different ways that we hadn't seen before, at least in my own you know, uh, um, eyes. So people who were naturally creating spaces collectively to figure out what they could do from their particular vantage point at that particular moment to make sure Darren Wilson was arrested, right? And what they could do to make sure the police stopped killing black folks in Ferguson. So it was, it was informative in many different ways. But I wanna pivot and ask you all a, a question that somewhat relates to that. And I'm paying attention to time because you know, we have to close up in a minute when I offer if we have time, uh, questions from, from, uh, from the audience. But considering where we are now, and Brother Bill, you laid out a very clear uh, uh, analysis of the different um, uh, different uh, kinds of things that we're up against. Um, you know, both of you over the past few decades have contributed greatly to the liberation of our people. You've seen significant shifts in our people, um, our history, and have witnessed significant advances and setbacks. Right now, we're in another pivotal moment. What challenges and opportunities do today's dynamic offer us? And what are the mandates and urgency of today that we have to pay attention to? Brother Bill, we'll start with you. Um, 
This is a moment where uh, all bets are off. The um, we're, we're, I, was, I was describing to someone today that we're looking at the clash of tectonic plates, you know, the, the, the plates that the, the, the continents are under, the clashing of them coming together and creating earthquakes. And those clashing are economic and environmental. And those earthquakes are all over, and we feel it. Everybody feels it. It's the anxiety that everybody has been feeling for years that people haven't really been able to put their finger on. Why do I always feel nervous? Why do I always feel anxious? It's not just about Trump. You know, it's like it preceded Trump. And it's this clashing of these tectonic plates. And what that has meant, what that has brought with it, is a uh, crisis for the capitalist state. And in response to this crisis, uh, this question of legitimacy, you have right-wing and left-wing solutions. Um, And so the right is appealing to race, xenophobia, sexism, et cetera. They're, They're attempting to bring back an era that is long since gone. They're trying to reassert the role of men uh, in, in, in Western Europe, or actually in Europe and the United States, reasserting uh, various versions of a white republic. These are, these are some of the challenges. I could go on and on about it. Mm-hmm. But it, the opportunities. The, mm-hmm. That's right. With those earthquakes... There's other there are opportunities, and those opportunities result as uh, from people having growing questions about capitalism, about whether capitalism has the capacity to actually respond to, let alone save, uh, planet Earth. Um, they have questions about racial construction, gender construction. And are looking for those alternatives. And while I agree with you, Rosa, about the disenchantment that many people have in organization, I think we have to remind people that that may be how they feel, but the other side doesn't. And they've got guns. Right? So I'm just being real. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, it's like people can say, well, I don't want an organization. Okay, fine. So why don't you go talk to the Proud Boys about them getting rid of their organization, right? It ain't going to happen. And and so we've got to understand that we've got to win people back to the importance of organization as both a generational bridge, but also as a way to avoid catastrophe. So I think that there's real possibilities and real dangers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I agree. I agree, especially around organizations, you know, I'm I'm in a different space. I'm not in a big city. I'm in a in a, an environment like, you know, Albany, New York is Cleveland, Ohio is Buffalo, New York. It's it's all these spaces that are not uh, people often don't pay attention to, mm-hmm. you know. And and in Albany alone, we've had 111 shootings for a city of less than 100,000 people with one high school and no community centers. So I literally, what you just spoke about, the anxiety, the stress, the tension, or am I going to get pulled over? Why are they on the block? What's going to happen is so real. And then also having to hold young people and be like, our ancestors did a lot and we're going to continue that tradition and we're going to have to like build you up. So all of that, I agree. All bets are off, you know? Hmm. Because what we've seen in the last week is once again, like all the white supremacist uh, trials that were not videotaped back in the day. I'm mm-hmm. like, this shit was happening in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. All this craziness where we'll pardon you 60 years after we um, killed you, mm-hmm. you know, under the death penalty. But the right is winning that war. You know, I, and I was telling the moon, but I told everybody, I'm like, everybody watch this documentary four hours in the Capitol because I had never seen what happened on January 6th from that perspective, which was video from the people that were the quote insurrectionists. 
that connected to Albany, New York, where I finally was like, this is the work. The Proud Boys, one of the biggest chapters was founded here in Albany, New York. And for a year, they were they were deal, doing their thing through tattoo parlors. And they mm. were just popping up. All that is that I, I completely agree with what Kwame Ture left us with. No matter what, we got to build institution and we got to organize, organize, and organize. And our elders from the 50s all the way to the 80s have shown us that it is possible. But in order for it to be possible, you have to be dedicated. Like this is not something you come in and out of. That movement and Black freedom is part of your DNA and you're mm -hmm. literally passing it down mm -hmm. to a younger mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, for the audience viewing, um, please uh, write down questions if you if you have. We have um, a few more minutes and want to make sure we at least get some some questions for you. And while we're waiting, um, I did want to ask you all because it was mentioned a few times in our conversation around mutual aid, right? Um, within the context of our conversation, mutual aid has been, I think, a very um, good example of what Black solidarity can look like. We know that in 2020, um, with the pandemic, uh, with all of the things that were happening, a mutual aid saved Black lives. That we know were it not for our communities stepping in, providing for each other, all of the things that uh, we, we did, um, and things that we've done throughout history. Like this is not necessarily a new concept, but for us to re-engage it in this particular moment, spoke volumes to not only how we need each other, but what our relationship is to the state and what we can and should expect and should not expect from the state, right? So I wanted you all to speak to a little bit about this concept of, of, of mutual aid as a uh, form of, of solidarity, but then also any other kinds of examples uh, that we uh, can or should lift up of, of what, you know, Black solidarity can and should look like today. Well, I, I mean, I would say with that, covering and and going down to, to the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina and the levee breach has just, you know, that was 2005 and I was down there and I know that the lessons that I learned was first, we have to tell our stories. And second, we got this. We've always supported our people. You know, it even brought me back to understanding um, my connection to actual land and dirt and kind of checking myself in this mm -hmm. narrative that I started believing about how dealing with the environment was a white thing. I'm like, no, that's why my mom saved an avocado pit. My dad put aloe vera in my ear when I had like all these things were like, we can do this for ourselves. We don't need all these Western institutions. But that mutual aid and then, of course, covering after Puerto Rico and, and, and what happened with Irma and Maria. And, and, and for me, Puerto Rico and covering it, being able to bring a team down there was so incredibly important because we saw a consciousness shift. I talked to my uncle who for in his entire life were like, Puerto Ricans can't do anything by ourselves. This is why we need America. And then I get to him and he's like, so uh, we got this covered on the block. And for me, it was like that consciousness shift, especially in elders, where they believed that without Puerto Rico, without the United States government, we can't govern ourselves. We can't feed ourselves. Change because of one catastrophe. And lastly, linking it to the, the struggle with the political prisoners and prisoners of war. When I'm, I'm thinking now about mutual aid, and that is part of mutual aid, but it's part of our responsibility. The wins that we have gotten, we have to uplift them more. We have to, because young people have to understand that getting out our PPs and POWs, not getting them out, us doing the work that we needed to do was not a five-year struggle. Some of these were literally 30-year struggles, but it is our commitment to that struggle. So for me, that's what mutual aid is. And just one more thing, I, I would encourage everybody, get a generator, dude, like be that person. I am that person. I don't have like a, 
bunker under the ground, but I, I got things because I saw that our people were dying because they couldn't get water. Our people were dying because they didn't have mosquito lotion to keep, you know, all this stuff out while these uh, catastrophes happen. I was like, I'm not going to be the one out there without some stuff. I tell people, get a generator, be stocked up, be ready. What does the underground look like if you don't have any communication? Stop depending on a cell phone. And I'm seeing that younger people are kind of crafting out all of these things and they're making it very accessible for anybody to be like, okay, I could build up my block or my street, you know, in case it goes down and what that's going to look like. Lumumba, I know that we're running out of time, and uh, I have to, with all due respect, respond to one of these questions that was raised up here by someone who was suggesting that the vaccines are worthless, uh, because it actually relates to mutual aid. Hmm. Um, I don't know what planet this person is on. Um, uh, I, I, I do know that I have lost at least three friends as a result of COVID. Um, and uh, I also know that there's a whole lot of people that would be dead now without the vaccine, just like there'd be a whole lot of people dead without the polio vaccine and a number of other things. So this ridiculous conspiratorial stuff undermines our community. And this belief in horse pills and other such things as a way of preventing the illness has no place in discussion. If you want to engage in science fiction, then do it. Write a book, write a comic book, right? But we're dealing with the lives of millions of people. If we want to talk about mutual assistance, the hospitals are not full of people that got those vaccines. The hospitals are full of people that have decided not to get the vaccines and are dying. This is about mutual support. Let's get off this BS. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, you know, we, we are um, going to close out, but I wanted to um, ask you both to just give us some closing comments. You know, we have a broad range of people, and I'm just now looking in the chat, of folks who are um, familiar with movement, uh, some folks who are not. Um, so I want to just give you, give you all an opportunity just to share some, some closing thoughts on this mandate that we're in around Black uh, solidarity, Pan-Africanism, um, how we need to move forward in this particular moment that we are in. Well, I'm going to let Bill close this out. So what I would say is first around the vaccine hesitation, you know, um, you know, it's real and it's in our families and it's like we have to have boundaries and we have to make choices. I'm like, you drink a quarter pint of Hennessy every day, but you don't want to take a vaccine. I'm like, I'm you take a Molly pill to go to the club. Like, I'm like, what? Like you putting stuff into your body anyway, you know, and and I, you know, Bill, I'm glad you you raised that because it it, it has broken relationships. Yes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it has. Where mm -hmm. I, you know, you've all dealt with that. So, but mm -hmm. um, I think my main thing is that history is so instructive, and being raised in Black studies and being accepted into a movement and being told I was a person of African descent being told I was Black, those are the most empowering moments of my life, the most defining moments of my life, you know? And I will never let anyone take away my Blackness, my daughter's Blackness, my family's Blackness. And that also means that I have a responsibility, particularly as a Puerto Rican woman, a Black Puerto Rican woman, to care about identity, but right now to really be helpful in, in what it means to fight back the oncoming terror that we won't understand until it hits us, but we need to be prepared for it. And Lumumba, if I have a moment. Uh, you do, I, yes, sir. Okay, I want to, uh, first of all, I want to thank you and, and thank the, the program for, for this. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Rosa, of course, um, uh, two things. One is for solidarity. First, we in the United States have to understand 
that the first act, one of the first acts of solidarity is recognizing that Black America is constantly changing and that it's not just the descendants of people that were brought over in 1619. We're talking about Cape Verdeans. We're talking about people from the Caribbean. We're talking about people from Latin America. We're talking about African immigrants that have come here and we have to engage in solidarity with them. They are part of the reshaping of Black America. That's point one. Point two, there's issues going on around the world where U.S. policy needs to be challenged. I'm heading up a campaign to end the Moroccan occupation of the Western Sahara, which is in Northwest Africa. I encourage people to get involved in such efforts to, to help to reshape U.S. policy and to help to fight various forms of tyranny, colonialism, and, and settler colonialism. There's things that people can do. There's no room for passivity. The time is now for action. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Brother Bill. Thank you, Rosa. Um, thank you all for, for, for tuning in and logging on into this very important conversation. What we heard today um, is a challenge, a charge, but more importantly, I think it's an invitation. It's an invitation for those of you who are on the sidelines, for those of you who are not engaged as much as you would like to be engaged, to get engaged. It's an invitation to participate in some instructive uh, ways to, to do that. Um, we, we, we heard from both Rosa and um, Brother Bill talking about learning by way of listening, recognizing our privilege, knowing when it is time to actually be quiet and listen, join an organization, whether that is a traditional organization or a non-traditional one, but we have the mandate and what we don't have is the luxury to contemplate whether or not we should be organized and recognize as, as, as what brother um, Bill's talked about the culture of solidarity how do we make sure we reflect that in a principled manner so again i want to thank you all for joining us um and if you can where you are give your round of applause and thanks to our panelists rosa clemente brother bill fletcher uh to the organizations the caribbean culture center african diaspora institute the dr betty shabazz and malcolm x uh, Memorial and Educational Center, and we ask that you all tune back in for the next um, uh, installment of the Critical, Critically Black Dialogue series. My name is Lumumba Bandelli. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Lumumba, Kat, and everybody at the team.